Welcome back, everybody. Now, since I've played practically every 2D Mario game there ever was, it's finally time for us to take a look at Mario's 3D Adventures. And a lot of you, I'm sure, were really looking forward to it, especially my good friend Sam. Yeah, I read your notes, Sam. Anyway, here's my long-awaited review of Super Mario 64 for the Nintendo 64. And please stop asking me why I reviewed all the 2D games first. That's just how I roll. With the PlayStation and Sega Saturn fresh on the market, the year 1996 was the time for Nintendo to really kick things up a notch, and it was clear that if they wanted their new console, formerly called the Nintendo Ultra 64, to have a strong start, they would need to bring their most famous character along for the ride. The result was Super Mario 64, released in North America as a launch title for the Nintendo 64 on September 26, 1996. Also, I'd just like to point out that Crash Bandicoot was technically already out in the States before, but Super Mario 64 came out in Japan first. As for the United States, Mario still managed to get all the attention. That greedy little pasta munching hooligan. Anyway, Super Mario 64 was considered to be one of the most revolutionary video games of all time, and it still is. This game made popular the 3D platforming genre almost single handedly. But after 19 years, how does it hold up? And does it make for a strong 3D debut? Well, be patient because we're gonna find out. Alright, so when you start the game, you get a coin sound effect, it's all good, and then. Bah! Oh, uh, hi Mario. You're, uh, kinda looking at me funny. Okay, I admit, this is pretty weird. I mean, I get they're trying to emphasize the whole 2D to 3D thing, but a giant floating severed Mario head? Really? At least you can mess with his face, despite the often disturbing results. Anyway, after getting past hey, that, whatever it is, we're treated to the opening cutscene. Princess Toadstool, who now calls herself Peach because... Japan, sends Mario a letter inviting him to the castle for a slice of cake. The camera then tracks around Peach's castle, the music builds up, and we see a warp pipe appear. Which can only mean... <laughs> Woohoo! There he is! Now that's what I call a fantastic opening. I never would have imagined a moment like this having such great build-up. Not to mention, Mario looks great. He literally looks like somebody took a 2D drawing and made it into a full 3D model. Mario in this game is both appealing and instantly recognizable. In fact, while we're on the subject, I've gotta say, for an early Nintendo 64 game, Super Mario 64 looks incredible. While I personally believe it's not quite as lively as Crash Bandicoot, it still manages to be just as bright and colorful as the 2D side-scrollers that came before. Though most of the character models aren't very pleasing to the eye, specifically Thwomps, Bowser's model kind of bothers me too. I'm not sure if he's supposed to be scary or ugly or both, but in general, he just looks weird. Oh, wait a minute, I just remembered something. I can't talk about Super Mario 64 without mentioning the man who brought Mario's voice to life. I'm of course talking about God's gift to all mankind, Charles Martinet. Martinet was first cast as the plumber for a series of road shows where he would use some complicated machinery called Mario in Real Time to make it seem like people were actually talking to Mario. It was an even creepier floating Mario head, but it was still him. An updated take on this idea can still be seen today at the Nintendo World Store in New York City. I've met him before and it was a blast. Charles Martinet didn't start voicing Mario in video games until Mario's Fundamentals, or Mario's Game Gallery, whichever it's called. And this, essentially, was what led to him providing Mario's voice again for Super Mario 64. So while this game wasn't Charles' first appearance as Mario, it was definitely his first fondly remembered performance. If I can talk about Martinet himself for a second, he is without a doubt the happiest human being I have ever seen. If you've seen interviews with him, Charles Martinet obviously loves living out every single day of his life, knowing that he's gotten to provide the voice of Nintendo's most beloved character for well over 25 years. And needless to say, I absolutely adore his performance. His clean but charming sense of humor, his ability to completely become the character, to a point where he might even answer the phone in Mario's voice, I just love everything about him. 
The day Charles Martinet departs from this world will be one of the saddest days of my life, because even if they bring a new guy in to replace him, the joy Charles has brought to me for so many years can never be recaptured. Charles, if you're watching this, thank you. You've inspired me in so many ways, and I hope you never stop loving what you do. Wait, am I still talking about the game? Uh, oh, right, we should probably get back to that. Anyway, when Mario arrives at the castle, Princess Peach is nowhere to be seen. It's not until after you talk to this random toad over here where you learn that Bowser has not only captured Princess Peach, big shock, but he's also stolen the castle's main source of power, the Power Stars. By harnessing their power, he's managed to create worlds behind different paintings located in the castle, and Mario's mission is to travel to each world and retrieve the stolen Power Stars, in order to restore power to the castle and rescue the princess once more. So, yeah, the plot's a little more involved, but as per usual, it's not really the main focus. I don't see why people have a problem with that when it comes to Mario games. Guys, if you want to play a Mario game with a really good story, go play Thousand Year Door. I should look at that game sometime, but now I'm really getting off track. Alright, so the game starts you off in Princess Peach's castle. This is pretty much what you'd call a hub world. Each room has a magical painting that Mario can jump into, causing him to end up in different worlds. It's in these worlds where Mario can collect power stars, which you need in order to unlock more rooms in the castle. Short and to the point, I love Peach's castle. The entrances to each world are never far apart from each other, it's not too big, and you're given enough room to just run around and learn to get accustomed to Mario's controls. As for Mario, for the most part, he controls pretty fluently, if a little loose. Since Mario's now mapped to an analog stick instead of a D-pad, that means he can run around in any direction you'd like. There's even a camera feature that lets you rotate the camera to give you a good view of your surroundings. It works great for the castle and some of the Bowser levels, but in general, it's pretty stubborn and admittedly a bit archaic. In some cases, I'll end up dying either because of stress building up and causing me to rotate the camera in the wrong direction, or because of the camera just outright refusing to cooperate. Sometimes I wonder if the game just wants me to die. Going back to Mario, most of, if not all of Mario's classic power-ups from the 2D games are nowhere to be seen here. But it's cool because now Mario comes packed with a whole new arsenal. He can do all kinds of jumps, including the long jump, wall jump, triple jump, backward somersault, dive, kick, punch, ground pound, and even climb up walls like Spider-Man. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, does whatever a Spider-Man can do. While we're on the subject of added quirks to Mario's moveset, Mario's also sporting an 8-part health meter. Instead of turning into small Mario when taking a hit from an enemy, and then losing a life when hit again, a piece of the health meter gets taken off, and once it's wiped out, Mario's booted out of a painting and loses a life. You can refill it either by collecting coins or... breathing air. Huh, I guess 3D Mario can't survive underwater as well as 2D Mario can. In all honesty, I love the health meter a whole lot more than having to rely on super mushrooms. It makes Mario much more versatile, and he can last a little bit longer given the situation. Speaking of the super mushrooms, some of you might be disappointed with the lack of classic power-ups, but I really don't mind at all. When I play 3D Mario games, I love completing levels by relying on my platforming skills rather than simply roasting enemies with a fire flower. Besides, Mario 64 does have power-ups of its own. Often you'll find secret areas that have red, blue, and green switches, almost like the Switch Palaces from Super Mario World. Activating them reveals blocks that contain different caps for Mario to wear that give him special powers. The red block gives Mario access to the wing cap, letting him fly like an eagle. The thing is, when Mario's gliding through the air, he doesn't exactly have the most graceful controls. In fact, it controls so poorly that I wish he actually could fly. Still, it's the power-up everyone remembers the most, so I shouldn't be too harsh. Anyway, the blue block gives Mario the Vanish Cap. Putting it on causes Mario to become invisible, letting him avoid contact with enemies and phase through certain walls. As far as I know, it's really only needed for two or three missions in the entire game, not counting the Secret Star and the Vanish Cap course. But at least the invisible textures on Mario are pretty cool. Finally, the green block gives Mario the Metal Cap, which is my personal favorite. It lets Mario walk underwater, and it makes you invincible for a short time. I love using this thing whenever it's available to me. It might not come off as that cool to some, but I can pull off some pretty funny tricks with the Metal Cap. <laughs> oh, and I should point out that after this game, Metal Mario ended up becoming his own character for other Mario games. Why? So, like I said before, your goal is to collect Power Stars. I almost kind of consider it to be a collectathon platformer, and if you've seen my quick smash on ukulele, you might remember how much I'm not really a fan of collectathons. But here's why Super Mario 64 works better. Each world is broken up into different missions, there's only one star per mission, the objective needed to accomplish for getting each power star is easy to figure out, you can get them in any order you want, 
and you don't need to collect them all. This adds a level of freedom and open-endedness that I honestly don't think any other Mario game, let alone platformer, has recaptured. Super Mario 64 can also be different with each playthrough because of it, which I also think increases replayability. That's the way I like it. La, 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 la. Sometimes the open-ended nature of Mario 64's gameplay can work in your favor without you even trying. For example, in the sixth world, Hazy Maze Cave, I found myself wandering around mostly collecting coins or just having a little fun. Then, during my travels, I accidentally stumbled on a power star from another mission that normally takes me a little longer to complete. Other times, like in TikTok Clock, I would decide to take a leap of faith and just so happened to land next to a power star from a later mission. It's stuff like this that I think adds a lot of meat to the game, and it gives me more of a reason to pick it up and play. No stupid microtransactions or anything. I'm digressing a bit here, so let me talk about the worlds. They're surprisingly really big, and they each differ vastly in terms of atmosphere and visuals. I can't pick out my personal favorite because all the worlds are just so great. Babam Battlefield, Snowman's Land, Jolly Roger Bay, Wom's Fortress, Big Boo's Haunt, I love them all. Though I will say, Big Boo's Haunt does get a little... <laughs> <clears throat> I'm sorry. I guess my least favorite might have to be Tiny Huge Island. I still enjoy it, to an extent, but it's not quite as exciting as- ah! <sighs> Oh, good golly, what a spook! Each world has about six main missions, plus a secret star that we'll talk about later. Some missions are completed by doing something as simple as get to the top of the fortress or slide down a slide while also working your way into a Doctor Who title sequence. A few missions have you hitting a yellow block in order to collect the star, and occasionally, and by that I mean once, you'll have to return a lost baby penguin to its mother. But just getting the baby there can be kind of annoying, mostly because... Oh. Um... Help? I, I don't know what I did, but help? And I'm sure I'm not the only one who did this, so I'm just gonna show it to you. Tee when you're not mooching power stars off of Toads, or this little yellow rabbit named Mips, other missions will have you collect eight red coins in order to make the star appear. For the most part, the red coin star missions aren't that bad, but unless it's the red coin mission in Hazy Maze Cave, it can really be a chore. It's especially painful in Wet Dry World when, again, the camera just doesn't want to work. I would say these are my least favorite missions, but something worse is yet to come. Stars can also be obtained from minions of Bowser, and defeating them will grant you with the power star. These bosses, frankly, are pretty darn easy. They each take three hits to kill, their patterns are incredibly predictable, and whoa! Well, Mario's certainly gotten a workout after his last outing. This is also evident with the Bowser boss fights, which are a little bit harder, but that's only if you have really bad aim. You grab Bowser by his tail, you spin him around, and toss him at these bombs surrounding the area. If he falls off, he'll just come back for more, so you have to make sure he hits the bombs. Also, he can teleport now because things. But after you beat him for the very last time, Princess Peach is freed from within the castle walls, and everyone is happy. Listen, everybody. Let's bake a delicious cake for Mario. Wait, you didn't bake the cake yet? In the letter you sent me, you said you had a cake baked for me. Did you just forget to do it? Were you too busy binge watching Orange is the New Black or something? I mean, what were you doing? Don't write me saying you have a cake baked for me, and then just go inside and start baking a cake when we finally meet up. You. Are. A. Peace. Anyway, you might have noticed that I only have 70 power stars, when the grand total of stars in the game is 120. The thing is, I already know what you get after grabbing all the stars. Yoshi gives you 100 lives, and you get a sparkly triple jump. So I know that's what I could get after collecting all the stars, I just haven't managed to do that as of scripting this video. And that's only because a lot of these missions can really drag. This brings me to the 100 coin star missions. Within each of the 15 courses, you can collect 100 coins and grab a secret star for doing it. This doesn't sound too bad on paper, but in reality, it's an absolute pain! In some worlds it's pretty easy, but sometimes the coins can be so scarce and so hard to locate that it's borderline impossible! Without a doubt in my mind, these missions are the worst part of the game, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who thinks that. But I need to wrap things up because I'm pretty sure Mario's getting sleepy. Ah, spaghetti. Ah, ravioli. Ah, mamma mia. Yeah. So, 
Overall, what's my verdict on- Oh. Right. Forgot about that. In 2004, Super Mario 64 was re-released as a launch title for the Nintendo DS, brilliantly titled Super Mario 64 DS. This time around, you get 30 more Power Stars to collect and 3 more characters to play as. There's also a series of minigames that you can play in the Rec Room, almost all of which end up being recycled for the multiplayer mode in New Super Mario Bros. Now, the thing is, I don't exactly like this port that much, and that's all for one reason. I hate playing 3D games with a D-pad. The original Crash Bandicoot is my only exception because it was made with the D-pad on the early PS1 controller in mind, and it was designed around it. Super Mario 64 DS is what happens when you take a game that excelled in analog control, take away the analog control, and give it a plus control pad. It feels so unnatural, and the inclusion of a run button only hurts more. I guess if you felt like it, you could use the touchscreen as an analog stick, but it's even worse unless you're left-handed, in which case, be my guest. So, yeah, it's definitely not the definitive version, at least in my eyes, but they really wanted to show off the 3D capabilities of the Nintendo DS, and I guess it worked, for the time. But let's go back to the original. So, overall, what's my verdict on Super Mario 64? Well, despite how revolutionary it's considered to be, the game is definitely starting to show its age in a couple areas. But, as a whole, I had an absolute blast! Super Mario 64 successfully manages to take everything I loved about the 2D games that came before and transition them almost perfectly into 3D without making too many major changes. It's definitely not a perfect game, but I gotta give kudos to Nintendo for the design choices. I love how open-ended it is, and the fact that you can get a different experience every time you play it just makes it especially wonderful. And lastly, before I forget, this soundtrack is awesome. Minus a few songs that are a little too atmospheric for my liking, these are some of the best themes ever composed for a Mario game. And I'm sure I've said that about other Mario games, but I mean it. The main theme is great, the Bowser course theme is great, the end credits theme is amazing, and my absolute favorite is Jolly Roger Bay's theme. This is the most beautiful water theme ever composed not just for a Mario game, but any video game in general. And yes, I know everyone remembers it more as the theme to Die or Die or Docks, but let's be real. Jolly Roger Bay has a pirate ship. Your argument is invalid. So yeah, while Super Mario World is still my favorite Mario game of all time, Super Mario 64 is definitely in my top 10. There's a lot to really appreciate about this game, specifically the fact that it's still so much fun to play after nearly 20 years since it was first released. If you've somehow managed to avoid playing Mario 64, whether the original cartridge or virtual console re-release, do whatever you can to play it. It was great back then, and it's still great now. Alright, so Super Mario 64 proved to be a pretty strong start to Mario's 3D career. However, the plumber didn't step back into the limelight until Nintendo's next home console came around. Six years later, Mario made his debut on the GameCube with the game that everyone won't stop asking me why I hate. But do I really hate it? You'll just have to wait and see. Next time, we're taking a look at... <sighs> Super Mario Sunshine. Oh boy. Well, until then, this is Mark, aka Super Smash 3DS, bidding you all a smashing farewell. And it's time for a random shout-out! Yeah, I know I haven't done this since I think the new Super Mario Brothers video. I could be wrong about that, but whatever. <laughs> anyway, this time I'm giving a shout-out to the YouTube channels Nintendo Collecting and World of Nintendo. I'm pairing them up together because their channels are pretty similar. They're all about unboxing and reviewing Nintendo products, and both those guys have the best game rooms I've ever seen. For real, you need to check them out. They review and unbox anything from controllers to amiibo figures to Japanese products. You name it, they do it. That sounded wrong. Uh, <laughs> I put links to their channels in the description below, so if you want to check them out, you can do so. Uh, anyway, thanks for watching this video. I, please be sure to subscribe for more game reviews to come, and follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and especially DeviantArt. I do a lot of cool stuff on there. Um, like, just recently I've been doing uh, comics for Ed's World and stuff. They've been really good to me, uh, I've been really good to them. We're kind of like, a, you, you know, just like that. Oh, I messed up my microphone. <laughs> I'm terrible at this. Uh, so, uh, anyway, thank you guys for watching again, and uh, hopefully I'll see you next time. Take care.